right, boys! If you have not seen the previous videos, that's actually good since most of what was in those is now obsolete. Let's start with you. Yes, the big weird fleshy thing with hands watching this video. Yes, hands that are good at grabbing things. Maybe something round and small. Add a shaft, and now we have a joystick. Give it something to rotate around and build up the sides, and now it can go in four directions. Finally, put in some fun stuff to make it actually do something. By copying modern joystick designs, we get both a functional and reliable way of reading the joystick. The design consists of one axis being rotated directly, and the other axis getting rotated by the joystick pushing on its guides. Despite having four directions, the joystick only has two outputs, X and Y. When the stick is in the middle, the output is stationary. When it goes up, the output spins one way, and when it goes down, it spins the other way, and vice versa with the other output. Time for, well, uh, um, timing. Those outputs pass through a friction clutch, then are met by the changeover clutch, and it is momentarily passed through to the next step when it is time to read the inputs. During that momentary engagement, the axe will turn the air valve which will send back to the computer which direction is being held. When it is time to update the inputs again, this spinning arm will reset the valve right before it is changed again. Now that the direction has left the player control unit, it's time for logic. <laughs> Once it gets to the computer, there is something very important that has to happen before the input gets used. When you are playing the game Snake, you can turn either way or go straight, but you can't turn around. Let's say you are moving left and your input is right. The computer should ignore that input entirely and keep going in the direction you already were, which in this case is left. That is actually rather complicated to make work with gates and memory, but, as it turns out, is much easier to do mechanically. It's rather hard to see what's going on in here, so let's look at a cross section. At the core, we have a diamond with an X in the center, as well as a piece that we are going to call the Sorry Slider. The Sorry Slider gets moved inside the diamond by the pistons pulling it to each corner. If the opposite direction is pressed, then the slider will move from one corner to the opposite, but the X in the center will keep it in the original corner, doing exactly what we need. The hard part is actually reading this now filtered input. The reader covers most of the mechanism, but they work by the sorry slider pushing the reader arm up, which switches the changeover clutch to amplify the movement to change a valve. With four of these, we can finally give the computer your inputted direction. With our newly acquired input, it's time for the game logic. But it happens where you least expect it. The screen reader obviously reads the screen, but it also performs the logic needed to make that reading useful. It consists of two parts, one stationary and one moving. The red assembly hinges on the purple lift arms and the pneumatic pistons move that assembly. The valve gets pushed into the screen axles to read their state, and they stay pushed in while the logic and other shit is being performed. After which the pistons pull it back, and the valves get pushed back to the off state by the stationary bars. Now, you may be thinking, how does this perform logic? Well, to be honest, it's kind of crude to call it that, but that's really what it ends up doing. It takes the inputted direction, which then feeds the corresponding set of readers. That air flows into the set of valves, and whichever position the screen tile is in will switch its valve on. With that, the reader tells everything else what is in front of the snake when it goes to move. What happens next is decided by these valves. If it sees a snake tile in the way, then everything stops and the game is over. If it sees an empty space or food, then everything is good to proceed. And its next stop will be the tail memory buffer. A buffer has to shift all the data in it down each time it is read. 
but the writer also has to shift up to the next bit of memory each time it writes, which is at a different rate than reading. Using tread links and some other pieces, we can make a long line of memory. The parts on the belt form bits, and the tread allows them to be shifted down each cycle to be read. This inside pair of belts are driven by a stepper mechanism that moves the bits down one space each cycle. Whenever the reader reads a food tile, the other mechanism moves the outside pair of belts the other way. This moves the writer assembly up one and writes the direction that is being held. The writer takes the process controls and whichever direction is inputted will lift its matching setter. If it is not lifted, the bit will be pushed to the side. The bits then make their way on down to the reader. From here, the reader just looks like a mess of gears and clutches, so let's take a closer look. The bits will either pass to the side of it, representing a zero, or pass through it, representing a one. The bit will push on this piece, rotating the tooth, shifting the clutch, reversing the output, and switching the corresponding valve. The output of these valves are the direction the tail rider needs to move in to follow the snake body and remove the next tail tile. The output from those valves go directly into the screen towers, each direction going to its own set of pneumatics which move the rider. When moving side to side, ramps are lifted letting gravity push the gantry over one spot. Going up and down is much harder though. When going up, the mechanism in red will lift the gantry up one position. When going down, the mechanism in blue will push it off the edge and it will fall to the landing below it. All of this is used to move a sideways pyramid, which pushes the screen axles to the desired position. The screen axles then change the screen tiles. At the core, we have a long center axle which rotates the screen tile that connects to all the other ends. On the right three outputs, we have a rack and pinion converting the 180 degree rotation to linear movement over three studs. It also uses a Technic coat hanger piece to hold it together. The left output is a bit different though. It first goes through a handful of gears to change the output axis and then some more to gear it down. This rotates an arm to move a gray ball pin. The pin is then read by the screen reader in one of three distinct positions. These three positions correlate to the three different tiles in the game. Snake tile, food tile, and empty space tile. With a grid of these rotatable tiles, we can make a screen, and quite a large one too. We now have the world's first fully mechanical screen, and no split flap displays don't count. As cool as they are, they use a decent amount of electronics to work. That being said, this mechanical screen has no practical implications more than a novelty item, but it is pretty cool. What's not so cool is the fact that it takes up about two cubic meters slash yards, and of course, the cost to build this thing. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. After all, there's still one thing left to do after you die in the game. The reset mechanism has to take the computer and all of its parts out of whatever state it is in and set them up for a new game. It has to move all the screen towers to a preset position, reset and prep the tail memory buffer, clear and set all of the screen tiles to one or more preset states. It also has to do all of this in a specific order with varying times of completion. Basically the reset mechanism is going to be the most complicated part of this whole thing, so stay tuned. <laughs> Let's go through one clock cycle, or one frame of the game, just to see how everything works together. You move the joystick up, which then changes some clutches. Every so often it is time for the computer to read your input, so first it resets the pneumatic valves with a set of rotating arms. Then it engages the clutches momentarily, causing a valve to switch. These two valves power the pistons in this mechanism, and the piston for up gets powered, which pulls the centerpiece from its current left state to its new up state. This causes the left reader to fall down and the up reader to lift, switching both of the reader valves. Now the up air supply spreads to the rest of the computer where it first goes into the screen reader. 
The moving assembly of the reader gets pushed in and reads what is around the head. This air goes to the inlet of the top set of valves, and of those three, the left valve will get pushed in as it reads there is an empty space tile above the head. This then goes out to the tail memory buffer. A little before this, in the tail memory, the up air supply powers its piston which lifts the setter out of the way of the bit. While this happens, the now reversed left air supply causes its setter to lower. Now the air from the screen rear goes into this piston to cause the memory belt to advance forward. This causes two things to happen. Number one, at the writer, the left, right, and down bits in the buffer are pushed to the side while the up bit passes through. Number two, at the buffer's reader, the next direction is read as one of the bits pushes on the reader arm. In this case, it is right. That changes the clutch, reversing the output of the right valve. The valve then sends out air to the right air supply. This follows the orange path and causes the pistons to lift the red stepper which moves the tower left. It moves left because the tail rider is actually mirrored from the screen due to how it turns here. This causes the current tail location to be changed to an empty space tile. Around the same time as this, the head reader and the head writer will also move up with the air supply. And as it currently stands, the food writer will go in the opposite direction as the head, so it will go down. And we are done. We completed one frame of the game. And after this, the computer will wait a short amount of time to allow the player to move the joystick where they want to go. And then the cycle will repeat. <laughs> Why am I making this? I don't really know. But, uh, it's happening, so enjoy, I guess. And maybe even help me out with it. <laughs>